Do I need special permission to enroll in uh, 541? Yes. Okay. So you need to get the consent of the instructor, which is me. Okay. So, <laughs> so send me an email okay. um, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get them. And then I had a, also another question for um, if I'm applying a force to an area, is that a distributed load? Yes. Or is, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I was reading through it and for refinement, if you're, if I'm trying to refine like, like for the propeller, it's just one single geometry. So mm -hmm. I can't really refine a specific area on the geometry. It's just making the element size smaller. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. You can you can you can try to add refinement to like specific edges or maybe specific faces on the propeller. Okay. Um. And so maybe you know if you're seeing kind of a high stress in a certain area, you can apply refinement there. But generally for a part that simple, I would just refine. I would just refine the whole thing. Okay. okay. Just to make the size smaller. Okay. And then for mm -hmm. refinement. I've seen it used in like a couple of like homework problems and stuff. Is it mean anything more than just making the element size smaller? Yeah, there's 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 a little bit of nuance to it in terms of how Mantis does it. Because another way that you could do refinement is you can just apply local size into a certain area. Mm -hmm. And so when Mantis does refinement, there's a little bit of nuance in terms of how it how it kind of transitions from the refinement area to kind of the, the general mesh. Mm -hmm. uh, but for our purposes, it's, it's almost no. It's almost okay. So if you apply like a like a mobile size a space for like this. Okay. Cool. And then um sorry. Uh yeah, no one of the materials I was using is wood, but I don't know if that is um uh isotropically elastic. It's technically not, but but you can you can you can approximate it as I uh, as isotropic. Okay. And so if you if you can look up like a like an approximate Young's module or something. That's what I did and I didn't know how accurate that actually was or it it's it's accurate in, in certain situations. Mm -hmm. So the thing with anisotropy is that if you're loading it in a specific direction, you can use you can use um the Young's modules and that's totally fine. Okay. It's just that when you when you apply loading in certain other directions, like especially when there's shear involved usually, okay. that's when um that's when you may have to use a NS product. Um, but for but for this, I mean for this project, certainly, you know, I'm not expecting you to do it not an isotropic material. Okay. So just the isotropic one. And then uh sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to do it like like simulate like for my forces, like a um like what like an airplane propeller would like mm -hmm. kind of be like. Yeah. And I like if there's like five forces, but two of them are like um have to do with like twisting of the propeller. Um, is there a way we can do that on Ansys? We can. And okay. so you can, you can, that was like well, super obvious to me. How we, we haven't done it in an activity yet, but you can apply torch as a, as a, as a, as a mode. Um, and so you can, you can, you can do that as okay. well. Um, some dynamic forces, <laughs> it's going to be really hard to replicate in statics. Mm -hmm. So there's something, there's something you that won't be able to do. Um, you could, you can, you can approximate it using using forces and it works, but it's not going to be the same thing as having a dynamic force. Okay. Um, and with a moving propeller, you know, that's that's it's a dynamic thing. So yeah. It's, it's you could you could you could try to put forces in the same location that's and give it a magnitude that's like you know maybe higher than a static force. That, that's generally what happens in dynamic situation. Okay. But it's never going to be quite the same as as, as a dynamic. Yeah, because I think I was putting like dynamic forces on our like static propeller. Yeah. And um. I think it's just too much like the neutralic thing to get like I think like the deformation was like or like the uh distress for like the MP was like a thousand or like, yeah, that's probably it. Yeah. Right, but yeah, but it's uh yeah, because I mean even even when you amplify the force, it's still not quite like right. it's you know, a dynamic, you know, a dynamic situation is not just a bigger force. There's other kind of you know, you have some uh some elasticity, some damping that, that goes on there too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, actually, so activity five, which we're going to do um, soon, either next week or the week after that, we're actually going to go over the dynamic situations. Okay. Um, and so we'll learn a little bit about how to do it. All right. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Finishing up the report, mm -hmm. and what I've done is I actually have four different conditions. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Yeah.
And my second question is, I have a peer who wants to join us uh, next semester. Okay. Or any teacher. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of wondering like, what the grad assignment would be if you wanted to uh, sign up for the grad. For 410. Yeah. So it's usually for the grad assignment, um, I usually have them do an extra aspect of the final project. And so because the final project is so open, so I basically let you guys kind of choose your own topic. I kind of do those when kind of just a case study. Uh, I have the grad student propose something, and then I and then I kind of go back and say, once you add this, once you add this analysis to the, to the final project, it's either it's usually either like an additional feature within ANSYS, um, or kind of an additional analysis. That I, kind of I do those kind of on a case study. In the past, I'm sure it was the most recent grad assignment proposal. Uh, so last year, so last year was actually unique because we actually it was actually offered. At the same time as 540, there's kind of the graduate yeah. campus class. And so, 541. Uh, so 541 is kind of a theory based um, oh. FEA. 540 is kind of the more application. So 540 is actually more similar to 410. Okay. And so I had a student that was actually in both. You know, well, we shouldn't be talking about So what I had him do was that we learned an advanced feature within in 540. Uh, actually, optimiz it was actually optimization. Oh. So ANSYS has its own optimization package. And so I had him apply optimization to the have that be part of the portion. Okay. Well, yep.
All right, it's uh five thirty. Let's go and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's uh how's everyone doing today? We're good. All right, another uh, another week, another week of finite elements. Okay, um, so today uh, I think today will probably be the last day we, we do this direct stiffness stuff, and so uh, we're gonna do we're gonna finish up the example from last time, and then we're gonna uh, talk about one last topic, which is distributed mode. Uh, so distributed loading, you know, even though I have it kind of categorized here under direct stiffness, uh, I think this is I think this topic is actually good to know uh, just so that you kind of see can kind of understand a little bit better about what's happening when you do do a distributed mode in, in ANSYS, which has basically been all our loads so far. And so all the loads we've been applying so far have been distributed. Uh, and so, you know, when you do apply that, ANSYS does need to do something in order to make it actually feasible for your finite element problem. So uh, we'll talk about that uh, today. Okay. Okay, so announcements. And so uh, so there's uh, the midterm project is due tomorrow. So I, I know probably a lot of you are, are working uh, hard on that. Uh, remember, it's due tomorrow at uh, at basically at midnight. And so 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday, November 1st. Okay, uh, So make sure you get that submitted. Um, so I, I, I will I will try to grade those as soon as possible. And so uh, so I think the day the day that I'm most free to grade is Friday. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of do my best to try to knock it all out on Friday. Uh, but it's kind of a lot. It's because there's there's a lot of you guys in the class. So and if I don't get it done by Friday, then early next week uh, for sure. Uh, so before next before class next Tuesday, they should all be degraded. At least at least that's my plan. Right? Uh, and so with that, you know, I, I know I'm kind of behind on grading on, on some of the other stuff. So I, I just I just graded your activity for uh, this morning, um, and uh, you know, so so I'm, I'm I'm just kind of slowly catching up on on grading stuff. This class is not so bad, but actually my previous class, I'm, I'm actually quite hot in, in that one. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to try to catch up on that. Uh, okay. Uh, the other announcement I want to make is that the next homework assignment has been posted. Um, it's not an ANSYS activity. It's it's act, it's an actual problem set, uh, and it's uh, based on all this direct stiffness stuff that we've been covering. So springs, trusses, 2D trusses, and finally beams. Uh, is going to be on that homework assignment. So I just posted it um, just last night, actually. Uh, but actually, after today, you know, you should be able to do everything on that assignment. And that's going to be due in just about two weeks. Okay. Um, and so it's going to be due kind of right before our midterm exam, which is going to be um, the 16th of November, the last the last day of class before we meet for Thanksgiving. Okay. Okay. Uh, so make sure make sure you take a look at that homework. It is it is a fairly long homework, and so um, you know I I do want to warn you that it, it's it's going to take a while. If anything, just for the writing, because there's a lot of matrices that you have to write. So make sure you get started on it early, uh, just so that you're not kind of frantically doing it. So that's that's a homework where you know I think it's actually impossible to try to do it the night before, uh, just by the sheer volume of calculations that you have to do. So you know make sure you get started on it uh, early. Okay, um, any questions on anything that I just mentioned before we get started for today? Okay, okay, so let's uh, so let's uh, pick up where we left off last Thursday. And so actually, I'm going to go back to uh, the last week. Okay. Okay, so this is the example that we left on last uh, last week. And so we have kind of a two beam system. So we have beam A, beam B, uh, and we have a spring that's attached to it as well. And so kind of the, the, the purpose of this example here was to kind of show you how do you combine a spring uh, and, and, and also by proxy a, a truss together with a beam because, you know, the beams have a totally different mode of deformation than the, than the springs or the trusses, okay? And so what we, what we said was that, you know, if, you were, if you're going to combine elements like this, you want to make sure that their degrees of freedom are, are matching. And so what I mean by that is that you know that they that they go in the same direction. Okay? And so and so for this example, you know what I told you is that the spring here is actually a vertical, right? And so when the spring kind of elongates or compresses, that's going to be in the same direction as the transverse displacement of the beam itself. Okay. And so in this case, we have a matching, and that matching is going to be, is going to be reflected in our global stiffness system. Okay. And so what you're going to see is that the the entries for the spring are going to overlap. With the entries for the uh, uh, for the beam. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, and continue that. Okay. So let's start our uh, direct stiffness um, kind of uh, recipe here. Okay. 
So let's go ahead and write out the element stiffness matrices for these uh, for these elements. Okay. Okay. So we have three elements here. We have two beams and a spring. So let's go ahead and write those those out. Okay, so element A, element A here is a beam. So let's go ahead and write out the expression for that. And so the element stiffness matrix for a beam, for a beam we went over last time. So it's EI over L cubed multiplied by 12, 6L minus 12, 6L. And then we're going to write that into the first column like we usually do. Okay. Next, we have 4L squared minus 6L. 2L squared, okay? And 12 minus 6L minus 6L, 4L squared, okay? So that's our four by four element stiffness matrix for a beam, okay? And then just like we normally do, we're going to write out the degrees of freedom or the nodes that this beam is attached to. Okay, and so element A is uh, is is attached to nodes one and two, and so what we're going to have here is U, uh, U or excuse me, I always use U, um, D one Y, theta one, D two Y, and theta two. Okay. <clears throat> Of course, in this problem, we have numbers for this, but uh, but plugging in the numbers is actually more hassle than, than we think it out. So uh, we'll plug in the numbers at the very end, okay? Okay, then we have element B. So element B is also a beam, and in fact, it has the exact same properties as the first beam. So, um, and so the numbers inside the element stiffness matrix are gonna be the same, but remember, element B is gonna be different in that it, it it's attached to different nodes. Okay, so let's go ahead and just uh, write in very quickly the, the entries of this element stiffness. Right, so it's just it's just literally just a carbon copy of kind of what's what's above it. Okay, the only difference for for element B here is that it's it's attached to nodes two and three. So we have a D two Y, theta two, D three Y, theta three. Okay, okay. And then finally, we have element C. So element C is our spring. Okay. And so spring, in this case, you know, we're, we're going to assume, so there's a couple of ways that you can do this. And so uh, on the one hand, you can say that this is a two-dimensional spring, right? And so we, what we can say is that it's theta or its angle of rotation here is 90 degrees, okay? And so you could very well kind of use our, 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 our two by two element stiffness matrix for a spring and, and kind of use that that there, okay? And so you have uh, D3, um, X, D3, Y, D4, X, D4, Y, okay? So that's totally valid and, and, you'll, and you'll get the, the right answer for that. Um, it's, just, it's just gonna be a lot more writing. So you can be a little bit more clever in this case because we know, right? Based on this figure here, we know that L L element C has its um, kind of its axis aligned perfectly with the transverse displacement of element B, okay? And so what we can say is that case C here, we're gonna use our typical two by two, our, yeah, two by two uh, matrix here, okay? And so we know that element C here is connected to nodes uh, three and four, okay? So we're gonna have D3 and D4, right? Normally, for a horizontal spring, these would be in the x direction, right? So we have d3x, d4x. But since the spring is vertical, you know, we can say that this is going to be d3y and d4y. Okay. And 
And so we kind of take it, we kind of take advantage of the fact that, you know, the spring is vertical. And so it's degrees of freedom are going to be in the y direction. Okay. Let me go ahead and show you the alternative. Okay. And so the alternative, of course, is to is to assume that it's a, a 2D element. Okay. And so if you assume that's a 2D element, KC would look like the following. So we have a K out here. And so, you know, you can plug in the, the value of, of theta is equal to 90 degrees in our in our two by two truss, uh, or excuse me, four by four truss uh, element stiffness matrix, okay? And then if you uh, have the degrees of freedom here, this be D3X, D3Y, D4X, D4, okay? So mathematically, these two things are, are the same. It's just, you know, you can save yourself some writing if it's, uh, uh, if it's a 90 degrees like that, okay? So I'm going to go with the one on the left, um, just so I, I I can avoid writing D D three X and D four X uh, in the final global system. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Uh, any questions on this so far? Yeah. So, uh, data would data be the lower number node is where you draw the positive axis. Yeah. So, oh, would it be 270? It would, yeah, oh. yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So, in this case, it wouldn't be 90, it would be uh, 270. Thanks for catching that. Yeah. Because uh, because our, 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 our spring is like this. So, we have three, four. And so, to get in order to get into this position, we'd rotate 270 degrees. Yeah. So, uh, good, good catch. Right. Any other questions on, on how we obtained, uh, obtained these? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to the next step in the direct stiffness uh, process. So let's go ahead and do assembly. Okay. Okay. So we're going to assemble our three element stiffness matrices here into one big system. Okay, so this is going to be a big system. How many? We have seven rows and seven columns. So I think this is probably the biggest one that we've done so far. Actually, let me write in the columns first. We have U, one, Y, and one. Keep writing U, it should be D. D, one, Y. D, two, Y. Data, two. D3Y, theta 3 and D4. We don't have a theta, uh, we don't have a theta 4 because the node 4 is only attached to the spring. And so we don't have to consider any rotation of that of that node. Okay. Okay. And then we have the rows. So we have D1Y, theta 1, D2Y, theta 2, D3Y. Data three and D four. Okay, good. F one Y, M one, F two Y, M two. Okay, good. So it all it all fits on one page. Which, which isn't always the case. All right, and so uh, so to make our life simple, uh, just because we know both the beams have that factor of EI over L cubed out in front, okay, I'm just going to put that factor out in front just for now. Um, and so it's going to make it's going to make our insert, it's going to make our uh, our placement here a little bit easier in terms of in terms of writing. But we have to we have to make sure that when we place our our spring element stiffness matrix or element C, we take that into account because our spring element stiffness matrix does not have an EI over LP. Okay. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention that once again. Okay. So let's go ahead and add, start adding these in. Okay, so we'll start with element A. So element A is nodes one and two. So we're gonna highlight all the rows and all the columns that have to deal with um, nodes one and two. So that's all of these guys there. 
That's going to come down to just about here. Okay. Okay, so that's element A. I'll I'll fill I'll fill it in all together in a in a second. But let's uh, let's box all the uh, let's box all the elements first. Okay, then we have element B. So element B is going to be nodes uh, two and three. And so that's going to be these right here. That's almost all the way to the bottom. So we have that overlap for node two because that's where uh, that's where the two elements are attached, right? And so it, it makes sense that there's overlaps uh, at node two. Okay. Okay, and then we come to element C. So for element C, we have to be a little bit careful here because this is a this is a spring, right? Um, and so remember, a spring does not interact with any rotational degrees of freedom, right? And so even though it's connected to nodes three and four, okay, notice that how at node three we're computing theta three, but the spring is not going to interact with theta three. So this could be nodes three and four, excluding theta three. Okay. Because if you look at our element stiffness matrix for our spring, you know, it's only D three Y and D four Y. Okay. So theta three is not in there, which makes sense because you know our, our spring is only a two by two element stiffness matrix. Okay. Okay. And so those uh and so those parts here, so we're gonna do d three y and d four y. So this is gonna be uh it's gonna be separated out. Okay. So we have one entry right there. So that's gonna be the d three y d three y uh location. And then we have this one right here. So that's D three Y D four Y. We have this location right here, and we have that location right there. So that's D four Y D four Y. Okay. So we're skipping data three for this one. So the spring, the spring does not affect any rotational degrees of freedom. Okay. Okay. All right, so we've boxed out the areas, and so let's go ahead and add in our entries here. Okay. And so uh, let me go start with element A. So element A here, we have a 12, 6L. Remember, we factored out that EI over L cubed out in front, and so we can go ahead and just write in their simplified forms here. L squared, 6L. 2L squared. Okay. <clears throat> and so for the parts where they intersect, I'm just going to go ahead and, and just add and simplify that. So I'm just kind of combining those steps, right? Normally what you would do is you'd write out the, the element stiffness matrices for each element and then just add them up individually, but I'm just kind of combining those. And so for the for the parts where they overlap, um, uh, excuse me. So, uh, okay. So question in chat. So why don't we add D4X into the assembly? Yeah. So we don't add D4X into the assembly uh, because our spring here is vertical. And so our spring here is vertical. And so we can get away with using kind of a two by two element stiffness matrix like this. Um, and so you can certainly add D4X into the, uh, into the, into the stiffness matrix. Um, and in fact, you can do D3X as well. But what you're going to end up with is that the D3X row and the D3X column the D four X row, the D four um, you know X column, they're just going to be all zeros. So you're going to end up taking them out of the global stiffness system anyway. Um, and so we kind of we kind of just made a shortcut here. So you know because because we know the angle for this element is 270 degrees, we have this kind of simplified element stiffness matrix here where we only have four entries that are non-zero. And so we kind of you know um, flattened it into this into this system right here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so for the parts that are uh, overlapping here, um, for the parts that are overlapping here, we have 24, we have zero, zero, and then eight, 
L squared. Okay. Okay, and then we come to the uh, to the blue parts, and so I'll, I'll get to the part that's overlapping with the with the green in a second. But I'll go ahead and fill in everything else for now. So we have a minus twelve, six L, minus six L, two L squared. Okay, we have a minus twelve, six L, minus six L, two L squared. Okay, and then around this we have a six minus six L, minus six L. 4L squared. Okay. And actually, let me let me let me write in the contribution from this element statement. Okay. So we have a 12 that comes in from there. Okay. But of course, you know, since this is overlapping with an entry from the spring, then we need to add that uh, uh, that contribution. There. I think you're missing two negatives on the six L from the first one. Um, um, let's see. The two six L that are touching that are on the border of the. Thank square. you. Yes. Um, I think I had it. I had it. All right, let me see. Yeah, you're right. So both of these should be named. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So for the overlap parts, and, and actually for all the spring elements in general. You know, we have to add their contributions, right? And so we know from its element stiffness matrix, it has a contribution of K, okay? And so in, in some sense, we're going to have a K here. Minus K, minus K, positive K, plus K, okay? okay. But this is something you always have to be careful of when you're combining different element types, okay? Because remember, one thing that we did at the beginning here to kind of simplify our life was that we added this factor out in front, right? This EI over L cubed is in front of this uh, in front of this matrix, okay? That EI over L cubed is not present for the spring. And so we have to kind of almost reverse it for when we add our spring contributions here, okay? And so instead of just adding K, we're going to add K multiplied by the reciprocal of this, of this quantity here. So this is going to be plus K. L cubed divided by E I. Okay. And so that L cubed over E I is going to take place on every entry here. So the minus K L cubed over E I minus K L cubed over E I K L cubed over E I. Okay. So you want to be careful of that, and, and you know, and so in the homeworks, you know, you might see problems where you combine, you know, maybe springs and beans, maybe springs and trusses, trusses and beans, trusses, springs and beans. Okay, and so you know, be careful of the factor that you put in the front. So putting the factor in front is is very useful. Um, it's it's very nice to kind of simplify the amount of writing that you do. But when you have different types of elements, you want to make sure that you you take that into account. Um, and you and you and you kind of pre-multiply by the reciprocal if you have to. Okay. okay. And so all the other entries here are going to be zero because there's no uh, element stiffness matrix that overlapped it. You don't have to add the zeros. I, I like to I like to just because you know I'm 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 partially OCD I guess, but uh, but you're gonna you can of course just leave it blank. And leaving it blank just implies that there are zeros, but you know, I like to add them in just because you know it feels it feels nice. Okay. All right, any questions on uh, on this so far? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so that is the assembly part, and so the next uh, the next step here is to add the boundary conditions. Let me use orange. Okay. And so we have uh, three boundary conditions in this case, two constraints and one load. Okay. And so our first boundary condition is we have a fixed support at node one. Okay. Next, we have a fixed support at 
at node four. And then our load is we have a downward mode. Uh, and that's going to be acting on node three. Okay. So let's go ahead and apply these boundary conditions. And, and I'm just going to do them kind of in line here. Okay. So first, let's apply the fixed support on node one. And so fixed support means that it, it, it basically stabilizes all three degrees of freedom. So um, the Y displacement, the rotation, as well as the X displacement. Okay? Uh, so of course, we don't have the X displacement here because we have beams. But we do have a transverse displacement and a rotation on node one. Okay. So that's going to knock out the first two rows of the matrix. Okay. We're going to say goodbye to all these entries here. Okay. And we're going, to, we're going to turn all of this into zeros with the exception of the diagonal entries. So we're going to put a one on the diagonal. Okay. And then the right-hand side in the forcing vector, we're going to put a zero there as, as well. Okay. okay, so that's the fixed support on node one. Let's go ahead and apply the fixed support on node four. And so node four, we're going to change all of these to zeros here, with the exception of the diagonal entry, which is just the last entry. I know most of these are zeros already anyway, but you know, we'll go ahead and change it to orange. Okay. okay, so changing that last row there applies our second fit support. Okay. And then our final boundary condition here is a vertical load being applied on node three. And so node three, that's gonna be F3Y. And since it's a low type boundary condition, we're not going to make any changes to the matrix. We're only going to make changes to the uh, um, to the vector. Okay. And so we're going to have a minus P on here. Okay. And for all the other nodes, since they don't have any loads applied to them at all, no constraints. And so we're just going to change all of their values to zero. Okay. All right, and so that's our that's our system, and so now this is ready to plug into MATLAB. Okay, and so you know again, you know I'm I'm not I'm not expecting you to solve this this matrix system by hand. That that would be crazy. And so if we plug this into MATLAB, we get the following result. So we plug into MATLAB, we get D1Y, theta one, both are equal to zero, okay? So that's where our fixed support was. D2Y, this is equal to minus 0 0.02 meters, okay? Theta two, uh, typically, so when you solve this system, um, you know, uh, in MATLAB, the numbers that you get for the thetas are in radians. And so this is going to be a minus 0 0.012 radians. Okay. Okay, then we have D3Y, D3Y here. This is where the force was applied. So we should get the greatest amount of uh, displacement here. Okay, so our D3Y here is a minus 0 0.0638. Uh, and then our theta three is going to be minus 0 0.016 radians. And then finally, our D4Y, where our node four was fixed. And so that, of course, means that the displacement in node four is going to be zero. Okay.
Okay, so that is our that is our result. All right, any questions? Uh, any questions on this example here? Okay. All right, and so that and so that example kind of shows you that you can you can combine different el different types of elements together. Um, it's just that you have to be careful about how their degrees of freedom are interacting, and you have to be careful of you know when you're assembling, make sure that if you if you're pulling out a factor in front, to kind of take that into account into your other your other elements. Okay? So a couple a couple kind of you know fairly minor details in the grand scheme of things, but you know um, the thing is with these problems, and 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 everyone will kind of go through this to some extent on the homework. If you make kind of one small mistake, um, and so you know, let's say that you you kind of misplace one of these uh, one of these entries here, or you swap the sign or something like that, uh, it's going to lead to a result that makes you think you're off by more than that. And what I mean by that is, you know, let's let's say that you know, um, you know, uh, so so someone pointed out earlier, I missed the negative on this uh, on this six L right here, right? Okay. And so it seems like a fairly minor error, right? So you miss you missed a negative on one part, and with you know literally dozens and dozens of third terms, you think you know missing a negative that hopefully shouldn't impact too much. Uh, it actually does. And so if you miss if you make one small error like this, the result that you're going to get is going to be completely different to the fact that you know to the point where you you're going to think that like oh man I, I messed up really bad you know I I have no idea what I'm doing. It's it's not like that at all. And so these problems are kind of like it's it's kind of like everything or nothing. So, you know, and so even if the result that you're getting is, it seems like it's really, really far off, you probably only made one kind of small mistake. And so I would just kind of just go back and double check, just make sure all your numbers are correct, make sure all of your, all of your signs are in the right place, all of your, your assembly is kind of done in the right place as well. Uh, because more than likely, it, it, it's a small mistake that looks like a big error. And so, you know, if you're getting something that's way off, don't panic. Um, everyone does, everyone goes through it. So everyone, you know, you're going to, you're going to do these problems. You're going to make a small mistake. You're going to get something else far off. Like, oh my God, you know, I, I'm terrible at this, you know, I'm going to fail this class, you know, and so on and so forth. But, you know, most likely, you know, 90, 95% of the time, it's, it's usually just a small error. Um, and, you know, and then, but the unfortunate thing is that, you know, there's so many numbers to these, there's so many kind of steps that it's going to be really hard to find that kind of small error. So, um, you know, if, if you know what you're doing and, and you and you kind of get all the numbers correct, these problems don't take that long. But it's just because there's so many steps and making a small error, you're gonna spend you're gonna spend more time looking for errors than you are actually computing stuff in this one percent. So that's why I recommend you know start early because it's it's uh um you know it's 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 gonna take you long. I know I say that for everything, you know, every professor says that, you know, you start your assignments early, don't wait till the last minute, but you know, um but this, but this one, you know, you want to, you want to make sure you leave time for, for correcting mistakes. Okay. okay. All right. And so with that, let's, let's move on to kind of the last topic in uh, direct stiffness, which is uh, distributed loading. Okay. And so, so far in our direct stiffness, um, so I, I kind of had to stall for time for, for the internet to catch up, but it's still lagging. I put an underline under that, I promise. Okay, um, there it is. Okay, um, so, so far in our, in all the problems we've done so far under direct stiffness, you know, whenever we have a load, you know, we've applied them directly at the nodes, okay? And given kind of what we, what kind of the, given the process that we've been going through, you know, to solve these problems, that makes perfect sense, right? And so the, just the way that we've kind of set up our global stiffness system, right? When we have a load that's being applied at a node, we just kind of plop that right into the matrix. Okay? So that's, so that's, you know, kind of a, kind of a, a fairly minor detail up to this point, but it's, it's, it's one that kind of makes sense given the process that we've gone through. Okay.
All right, so it's been it's been pretty convenient for us, and, it, and it's actually one thing we've, we've, we've kind of paid almost no thought to at all. But in reality, you know, if, if you think about the the activities that we've been running in Ansys, you know, we we almost never apply a nodal mode. There's was, there was just that one really random time in activity three that we applied a nodal mode. And in fact, you know, actually in activity three, if you recall, you know, we, we talked about how, you know, it's practically speaking, it's usually not a good idea to apply a nodal mode, right? If you could take a mode and you can distribute it over, you know, at the very least distribute it over an edge, but even better, if you can distribute that mode over a surface, um, that's going to lead to a much more stable, much more kind of a, uh, you know, believable, um, you know, um, result, okay? So why so why is that? So why do we have this kind of disconnect between you know uh, kind of what we've been applying in direct stiffness versus what we've been applying in ends, right? And so because in theory, you know, these two should be should be close to the same process. Okay? And so you know, um, you know, practically, or I should say, kind of uh, strictly speaking, you know, uh, distributed loads don't actually exist in in pure finite elements. So this is an important point, right? And so even though even though we've been applying distributed loads within ANSYS, you know, what ANSYS is actually doing underneath the hood is that it's taking your distributed loading and actually converting that to um, what I call equivalent nodal loads. Because when, when ANSYS is applying loads to your model, right, it's basically applying loads to a mesh, okay? And that mesh has elements and nodes, you know, just, just like just like our direct stiffness problem, right? Given, you know, ANSYS, the ANSYS meshes and nodes are, are, are a lot more complex, you know, in, 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 in essence, it's kind of the same thing, okay? And so with that in mind, you know, ANSYS is kind of doing the exact same process that we're doing in direct stiffness. And so it, it's generating these element stiffness matrices, it's generating this global element stiffness or, or global stiffness system, um, it's, you know, uh, applying boundary conditions, it, it's modifying the matrix and stuff like that, right? And so if, if you, if you kind of look at all the examples we've done so far, you know, all, for all of the, um, direct stiffness problems, the rows and columns of our matrix correspond to not the elements, they correspond to the nodes. And so in order, basically, in order to apply any kind of distributed loading, we have to first convert it to nodal modes, okay? So we can take those nodal modes and plug it into our, uh, plug it into our matrix, okay? And so visually, you know, it looks something like this. And so I'm gonna draw you kind of a, a very simple picture here. Okay? So let's say that we have a beam, and on this beam, we have a distributed loading, okay? We have a load that's being applied on top of the beam. where our distributed loading is some functions, we'll call it W of X. Okay. 
<clears throat> usually that's that's how it is. And so usually you have a distributed mode that's given to you in terms of a function. Okay. In order to run this uh, on FEA, you know, before we can start assembling, you know, the, the element stiffness matrices and the global stiffness system, we have to change it to something like this. Okay. So let's I'm just going to assume we have just a single a single element here, right? And so this has to be converted into two nodal loads, okay? So one nodal load on each side, on each side of the uh, of, of the element, okay? And then sometimes you're also going to need a, a nodal moment. Okay? So this would be F1, Y, F2, Y, M1, uh, M2, okay? So this, so this has to be done before before we can do any kind of FEA calculation using distributed mode. Okay, and so what we're going to cover in this section is this kind of a not it's you know uh, you know everything we do in direct stiffness is kind of more uh, simplified, but a simplified version of, of of how we can actually convert these these two. Things. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Any questions on on this so far? Okay. All right. So how are we going to do this? How are we are how are we going to perform this transformation here? And so we're going to rely on on a concept known as work equivalence. And so the argument that we want to make is that you know by by converting a distributed mode to a, a nodal mode, right? They should be equivalent. Right? And so I, I kind of use that term a little bit liberally at this point. Okay? So let's define what it means for these two systems to be equivalent to each other. Okay. And so for two systems to be work equivalent, then the amount of work or the amount of energy that they impart on the structure should be the same. Okay. Because for any for any given elastic structure, right, the amount of work that you perform on it leads directly to its deformation, right? and so that's kind of another way another way to kind of uh, express it. So you know, if you were to apply distributed load on a structure like this and a nodal load, you know, they should lead to the same deformation. And, this being, and having the same deformation means that you know the amount of work that's being done is equivalent. Okay. Okay. And so that's and so another way to kind of express this is that you know we can say the work done. I don't know why I put in parentheses. So we're going to say work done by this distributed system has to be equal to the work done by the nodal, the nodal representation. Okay. okay. All right, so how are we going to compute work? And so in general, okay, general work is is uh, is taken to be the product of a force multiplied by a distance. Okay. You apply a force on an object over a specific distance, then that is work that's that's being done. And so I think the easiest example of this is, is gravity, right? And so if you take an object and you let it go, right? The object is going to fall a certain distance to the floor. And so if we take that distance from the from the top to the floor and we multiply that by the force of gravity, that's how much work gravity is doing on that on that object. Okay. Alternatively, you know, just because we're we're dealing with kind of forks and moments here as well, another way that we can compute work is by taking the product of a of a moment. Multiplied by its corresponding um, angular displacement, and so in other words, rotation. Okay. 
And so let me M times theta. With M here is a moment or a torque. And this data here is rotation. Okay. And so let's use that concept here. And so for for a for a nodal beam, and so for for a beam that we've been working with uh, so far today, okay, we have four degrees of freedom on a nodal beam. So if we draw a beam like this, right? We have node one on one side, node two on the other side, okay? We have a, uh, it's displacement, D1Y, D2Y. We have its rotation, theta one, theta two, okay? But then also we have its nodal forces and nodal moments, right? So we have its F1Y, we have its M1, and we have F2Y and M2, okay? <clears throat> so this is good right here. So for every node in the system here, we have a displacement and a corresponding force or moment that causes that displacement, right? And so we're just gonna multiply them all together. So the total work, total work done, okay? We're gonna have four terms here because we have four degrees of freedom and each of the terms is just gonna be the product of the force and the deformation that results from that force, okay? So we have F1Y multiplied by D1Y plus M1 theta one plus F2Y multiplied by D2Y plus M2 theta 2. Okay. And so this right here is the work of the nodal system. Okay. We're just taking products of, of the forces and their uh, uh, and their definitions. Okay. So that's good. So you know we already have one one side of the equation already. Okay. The other side of the equation is the work done by a distributed mode. Okay. So let's 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 work on that uh, here. Okay. Okay. And so for a distributed load, you know, a distributed load is just as the name implies, a load that's distributed over a certain uh, certain area of space. Okay. Okay, so this is usually given by by some function we call W of X. Okay. All right. And so the uh, uh, the work then must be that distributed load multiplied by its corresponding displacement. Okay. Not D1. Call it D, uh, dy of x. Okay. <clears throat> the work done by the distributed load is the product of the distributed loading multiplied by its corresponding displacement, both of which are functions of X or functions of space, okay? But we want this to be the total amount of work, right? And so, and so we're not only do we have to multiply these two quantities, we also have to integrate. And so by integrating it, that kind of adds the contributions from every uh, part of that, of that beam. Okay, so we're gonna integrate this with respect to X, okay? And we're gonna integrate from zero to L. We're gonna put a definite interval here, okay? Okay, so let me go ahead and label these quantities. So this W of X here is our uh, mode function. Okay. 
for the most part, at least at least for uh, at least for the problems I'm going to give you, and and even you know in general as well, this load function is given. Because that's something you're kind of you know directly applying to your finite element simulation. So you're you're going to know what the load function looks like. Okay. And then this uh, dy of x right here. So this one's new. So we haven't seen we haven't really seen a function like this before. So this dy of x here, this is the the distribution um, of displacement in our b as a function of x. Okay. And so let's 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 kind of take a moment to look at this integral expression that we have here. Okay. We have two main terms. And so we have the W of X. Uh, but the W of X we're we're not going to worry about because that's that's going to be given to us. And so you know that's not something we uh, we have to worry about. Um the integration, you know, even though it's integration, I know it's a pain in the ass, it's 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 not fun to do integration, but you know, in theory, that's something that we can do. Okay. The only big unknown here is, is this function right here, dy of, of x, okay? Because we haven't seen it before. So, and in fact, you know, having a having a continuous function like this is a little bit antithetical to uh, to the whole idea of finite elements. Where, you know, we're doing things in kind of finite, you know, nodes and elements and things like that. And so to have a continuous function here is, is kind of, it's a little bit strange. And so what we're going to do for the next, uh, you know, probably 20, 25 minutes until the end of class, is talk about you know what uh, what we're going to plug into this. Okay. okay. Any questions on uh, on this so far? Okay. All right. So let's work, let's work, let's work on that. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll down here. Okay. And so this section will be uh, distribution. Of definition. And a B. D Y. Okay, and of course the parents decide to lag right right here. <laughs> okay, uh, so let me let me let me talk about it first while the internet is is catching up. Okay, um, so what that basically represents is is how you know displacement or deformation is is distributed throughout the game. Okay, and so in every kind of direct stiffness problem that we've done so far, you know we've solved for the deformation at at different nodes in the in the in the structure, right? Whether it be the uh, trusses, whether it be beams or springs, okay. Um, but you know that's not the only place where deformation is occurring in our in our structure, right? And so in between all the nodes, you know, deformation is occurring as, as well, okay. And so if we draw kind of a, a beam, you know, like this, okay. All right. So this is kind of a typical uh, a typical you know situation. And in fact, let me make it uh, very similar to our examples here. So let me draw a node in the middle. And so if we were to solve this beam, you know, we get values for D1Y, D2Y, and D3Y. Okay. Right. I'm gonna ignore, I'm gonna ignore theta for a second, right? And so let's say D1Y is equal to zero because that's where we fix the uh, uh fix the beam. Okay. And so we'll say that D2Y is minus 0 0.02 meters, and we'll say D3Y is 0 0.06 meters, right? So kind of kind of stealing the numbers from the from the last exam. Okay. And so if we were to draw this, you know, it would look kind of something like this. Right? I'm gonna exag I'm gonna exaggerate a little bit. 
for this distance right here, this would be 0 0.02 meters. And this distance right here would be 0 0.06 meters. Okay. Right. That's essentially what we're what we're what we're saying, right? Is that you know the uh, that's how much the beam is deformed. Okay. Right. But implicitly, you know, and and you know, and you probably have already done this in, in your mind already, right? We know we know that the beam looks like this, right? We know that the beam doesn't look like this. And so, you know, because one thing that could be implied is that if you have a nodal displacement of that much, right, you could have a beam that kind of just totally detaches from itself like this, right? I don't even know, I don't even know how to draw this. And so, you know, maybe, maybe it looks like this. So maybe we'll draw kind of cut out like that. Where this distance right here is 0 0.02, and this distance right here is 0 0.06, right? We know it doesn't look like that, right? So when we solve a beam and we say it's displacement, or it's 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 not that just one slice of the beam is deforming. We know that the the the, the deformation is distributed kind of smoothly throughout the entire beam. And so our mind kind of does that naturally. So when we're, when we're looking at kind of the deformation at distinct nodes, you know, our mind kind of just almost kind of like fills in the blank. And, you know, in between, in between these nodes, we have kind of a smooth transition from one nodal solution to, to the next, okay? But in order for that to happen, in order for us to have that smooth transition, you know, we need, uh, you know, we need to have some kind of function that represents and the transition of deformation from one node to the next, okay? And so whenever you have kind of a smooth transition like this, you know, we can we can kind of um, model it or we can kind of um, um, quantify it using a function. Okay. And this function is exactly the one that we're looking for. So this this kind of function, which we which we've kind of already kind of implicitly assumed, at least in our mind, right? We can actually put this in functional form, which is the dy of x that we're that we're looking for. Okay. And so, and so now the question is, you know, how do we, you know, now that we kind of understand what this function is, okay, um, and kind of what its purpose is, the next question is, you know, how do we actually go about solving this? Okay? Actually, in fact, you know, before, before I moved on to that, you know, we, we've seen this concept before already as well. And so remember when we were talking about the, uh, the 2D elements and the 3D elements, this was maybe, you know, three or four or five weeks ago, you know, we talked about the concept of shape functions, right? And so this is exactly what those shape functions are. So the shape functions serve this exact purpose. So you can almost think of this, this function, this dy of x, as exactly the shape functions that we've discussed before, except in a much simpler form, because this is just a 1D, a 1D system. Okay. okay. So how do we determine, you know, what the shape function looks like? For a beam, you know, we're going to go back to its governing equation. Actually, this was this was something that we did uh, we, we did kind of gloss over at the beginning, but it's okay. It's okay, you know, we, we can kind of pick it up from here. Okay. And so if we look at the Euler Bernoulli beam equation, you know, it looks like this. And so we actually have a fourth, a fourth order derivative, which is crazy. I, I don't see fourth order derivatives literally anywhere else. Okay. okay. So we have a fourth order derivative in X. 
for that deformation v1. Okay. And so if we were to solve this, our solution to this equation here would be a cubic polynomial. And so I think someone someone asked, you know, when we were going over, you know, the shape functions for, you know, the linear quadratic elements, uh, someone asked me if a cubic element is possible. It is possible. And, and you're actually going to see one example of it here, okay? albeit only in a one-dimensional case, but so it's, it's a lot simpler. Okay? And so our general form, or dy of x, is going to be our generic cubic polynomial. So we have a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus uh, a3 x cubed. Okay. okay. Well, remember, our a coefficients here, a0, a1, a2, a3, those are arbitrary coefficients that we uh, that we can solve. For. Okay. Okay. And so how are we going to solve for these coefficients? Okay. And so to solve for these coefficients, you know, we're going to use the same process that we talked about when we when we talked about shape functions kind of way back when as well. Okay. And so if you remember, you know, in our discussion back then, you know, one requirement that we had was that as you as you kind of um, see your solution go from one element to the next, you should have continuity of the solution. So you should your solution shouldn't jump from an element to element. Okay. And so to another way to express that is is to say that you know we're going to enforce that this function satisfies the nodal solutions. And so we're going to have four equations here. And these four equations are essentially going to be our boundary conditions. Okay? And so we have dy. And so we're going to assume that our element has a length L. Okay? And so we're going to say dy of 0 has to be d1y. Okay? And then d dy dx at x is equal to 0. And so the rotation we're going to assume is just the same as kind of the first derivative of the of the deformation. Okay. And so that's going to be theta one. And then we're going to have the same things on the other side. And so at x is equal to L, that's going to be node two in our system. So dy at x is equal to L is going to be equal to d2y. Okay. And then d dy dx at x is equal to l, that's going to be equal to theta 2. Okay. okay. And so if we apply these four boundary conditions, that's going to give us four equations uh, for our four unknowns, a0, a1, a2, a3. Okay. Uh, so you know, I, I'm you know, we're not we're not going to go through the details of that because that would that would probably take an entire lecture uh, to solve a, a four by four system with symbols, um, which is uh, not fun at all. Okay, uh, but I will I will show you the result. Okay. We get the following uh, function. Okay, so we have dy of x is equal to. Okay, and this is uh, quite long, so bear with me. <clears throat> so we have two over l cubed multiplied by quantity d1y minus d2y plus one over l squared 
times theta one plus theta two. Okay. All multiplied by x cubed. Okay. So that's solely just the x cubed term. Okay, then we have the x squared term. So this is going to be a minus 3 over L squared times d1y minus d2y minus 1 over L, 2 theta 1 plus theta 2. Okay. Inside that square brackets there, that's the x squared term. Okay. The last two terms are really easy, so don't worry about it. So the, the, the linear term here is theta 1x, and then the constant term here is d1y. It looks really scary, but uh, but you know, just keep in mind that a lot of these are just constants, okay? because the next step is to actually integrate this, and so that's the uh, uh, that's the that's the kind of the, uh, the next step here. I think you know, doing these hand calculations. I think one one other goal that I had is is you know, hopefully you kind of uh, you kind of appreciate a little more kind of what everything everything that Antis kind of does underneath the hood, because you know, it does a lot of things, and so. You know, ANSYS makes it look very simple and makes it look very easy in terms of what, how you apply things, but there's a lot of really intense math and programming under the, underneath the hood. So, uh, you know, there's, this is this is just kind of a small taste. Okay. Uh, all right. Any questions on uh, on this result here? Okay, and so now that we have our expression for dy, we can go ahead and plug this back into our uh, work equivalence uh, statement. And so our work equivalent statement was the following. So remember, we what we're saying is that the work done by distributed force has to be equal to the work done by the nodal force. Okay. And so the distributed force, the way we're computing that is the integral from zero to L of W of X multiplied by dy of X dx. Okay. And this is equal to the nodal uh, the nodal work, so that's f one y uh, d one y plus m one theta one plus f two y d two y plus m two theta two. Okay. All right, and so and so the way these distributed loading problems work, we're going to work primarily on the left hand side of this equation. Okay, and so we're going to uh, we're, you're going to evaluate that integral for a given load function. Okay, and uh, for the dy of x, you're going to plug this one in right here. Okay, and so for dy of x, you're going to plug in our our kind of gargantuan expression there. The w of x is going to be given, and so this can be given by the problem. And then from there, all you're going to do is you're, you're going to evaluate the integral. And then after you evaluate the integral and you simplify it as much as you can, you're going to match up terms from the left and the right hand side of this equation. Okay.
And so what you're going to get in that case is that once you kind of match up the terms, what you're going to see is that you're going to have one term that has a D1Y, another term that has a theta one, another term that has a D2Y, and another term that has a theta two. Okay. And so what this is going to give you is going to give you basically four kind of four simple equations for F1Y, M1, F2Y, and M2. Okay, so after you after you do this integral and after you kind of uh, you know process everything and simplify it, you're going to get expressions for these. Okay, and these are perfect because these four quantities here, these are the nodal lows that we're looking for. All right, and so the next and so the next uh, thing that I have here is just an example, and so it, it's a fairly lengthy example. So we'll probably do that next time. Uh, I don't think it's going to take it's, it's lengthy, but it's not going to take us the whole time. It's only a page and a half in my notes here. So, um, and and it's mostly just integrating stuff. Um, so let's let's go ahead and do that next time. So let's let's end a little bit early today. Um, are there any are there any questions on any of this before we wrap it up for today? Okay. All right, and so remember the project is due tomorrow night. Um, I, I have one more office hours before they're due, and so that's at 5.30 to 7.30, or 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. tomorrow. Um, and so, you know, um, you're, you're definitely welcome to come ask questions, but, you know, because it is, you know, probably literally six hours before it's due, you know, it, it, hopefully it's only like just formatting questions on the report. Uh, if you're still working on the simulations tomorrow, then, uh, uh, you know, you have a lot of, you have a lot of work ahead, I'll, I'll say that. Okay, so thank you guys for coming today. Um, you know, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your evening. I, I hope you guys have a good Halloween. I know uh, probably you guys are working on the project, but you know, if you do get a chance to go out and, and trick or treat or and party and stuff, then you know, just make sure you stay safe. That's that's always the most important thing. So make sure you stay safe out there. Um, and I will see you guys all on Thursday. As far as like things I've done so far, I kind of have like already some links up there. Okay. okay. I kind of wanted to like clear it up before I start like finalizing stuff in the report. So sure. a couple more weeks, all right? Okay. Um, but for like the value permissions I have, like because I'm doing one wow. bracket, mm -hmm. but I have to do like kind of like a like an overhang projector for sure. a room that kind of mounts it near like a window. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And a window like kind of like. Brings in other like a Sure. Yeah. Or like a ball. Yeah. Absolutely. So, pretty much like my three loading conditions were one, someone like hanging off of it, like a kid hanging off like one side, so that the stress concentration on the was kind of uneven. Mm -hmm. So the two fasteners had uh, the high stress concentration the other side was like normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for another one, I had like a baseball coming through the window and hitting it off the side of the jeep. Sure. And then the last one was like a wind cord coming mm -hmm. out the window as well. Yeah. So those are all like solid. So if you, if you, yeah. Okay. That's, uh, that's good. For sure. And I also had a um, question about like the keywords. Yeah. Like kind of. Uh, like, don't don't worry about the keywords. Mm -hmm. So so that that template I gave you guys is kind of a standard template for mm -hmm. scientific papers. And so normally those keywords are is something that you put so that your paper is kind of easier to search for on Google and stuff like that. Uh, uh, but we're not we're not. Public, so we're not Okay, yeah, just don't kill them. And then, as far as like results of code exams, the like max serratus, max determination, and yep. whatever we established, like personally for our objective. Exactly. Like for mine, I established that I wanted to calculate sequence of numbers. Sure. I would include that with like my. Okay, that's perfect. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, Luke, I have two things for you. Yeah. Uh, have you gotten like any information yet from Sam or other guys about the conference?
options this weekend or I haven't. No. Not yet. Okay. So just wanted to remind you about that. I think they're gonna put something out during the week. Okay. Um, but it should be like from the morning ish to like afternoon. Okay. So it shouldn't be too long. Um if you want to say that there's an alumni part too. So I'll uh, speak in your phone too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. more than welcome to. Yeah, yeah. I haven't I haven't heard anything, but I'm I'm free to Saturday. So okay, okay. Oh, let's just Sam again and email you. Okay. Sort of stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. If they maybe if you email me, it might have might have gone to my junk. So okay. I turned up I turned up the aggressiveness of my junk so <laughs> okay. Because I got a lot of jumps in the schools. So. Okay. If I see uh, it, I'll forward it to you. Okay. Well, yeah. So you know. Yes. Yeah, so you from if it's coming from you, then then for sure it won't go to jump. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, send me the info and then I'll, I'll be able to. Okay. And then the other thing is that this like sort of like an advice question. If I like, is there like anything special I have to do if I like I personally wanted to hold off graduating for the summer just to be able to do like a co-op for a company? Um. So if you if you've already applied, um, did you did you already apply for spring? So we we would have to change that. And so there's there's a couple ways that we can do that. There there's a form. Okay. We have to pay like ten dollars. Oh, uh, don't, don't don't do that. Oh okay. <laughs> don't don't you give this full enough money. Don't give this full money. <laughs> um, so we can we can send an email to someone to change it. So okay. Uh, go ahead and send us an email to DSME uh, underscore advising. Just say that you want to you want to if you want to kind of push back your graduation date to take co op. Uh, and then and then we'll forward that email to the uh, to the guy because we know the guy that actually should. Okay, and I could like still walk, but like graduate. Of course. Of okay. Yeah, yeah. So for the for the spring commencements, um, you know, because people can graduate either spring, summer, or fall. Mm -hmm. And so for this for this upcoming spring 2024, that's for the spring 2024 graduates, summer 2024 graduates, and the fall 2023. Okay. And so you'll still be able to walk this. this okay. Cool. Sounds okay. good. That's yeah. all I got. Okay. Yep. I just wanted to ask you about sure. answers in general. Yeah. Um, because I'm trying to do this thing for the for Baja. Yeah. When I put if I if I make I'm trying to make a, a load, right? Mm -hmm. And I select two points, will the load be distributed among those two points? Yes. Or will it'll, it be it'll be it'll be it'll kind of um yeah. So if you do two points, it'll basically it'll basically count it as all one big area. And distribute that load kind of evenly between between that. So, for example, if I, let's say I'm trying to put 200 pounds of force and I pick two loads, it'll be 100 and 100. Basically, yeah. Okay. okay. It's not. Also, uh, if I were to put a uh, material that isn't on there, uh -huh. uh, when we did it before in one of the workshops, all we put down when we made the new, the new material was uh, it's the yield, Young's modulus and the ratio. Yep. That's mm -hmm. the only two things I need. Uh, I would I would put the density too, just in case, because uh, because uh, I think someone else had some issues, so they didn't put the density in there. Because if you do, if you add a load for uh, for standard earth gravity, it's gonna be expecting the density. But even if it's even if you don't use that, it's still good to have the density just just in case. Anything else? Uh, just those two. So okay. for for static situations, just those two. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Have a good night. You too. All right, Jaden, Marvin, any final questions? One more thing.